Hey everyone, thanks for joining us today. This is Grit Machine DNA, my podcast series, my YouTube channel series. We're interviewing incredible people who have done amazing things in their lifetime. I'm joined today by Coach David Dempsey, my high school football coach, somebody who I respect very much and admire. Wait to hear his story. Coach Dempsey, thanks for being with me today. David, thank you for inviting me. I'm excited and uh, look forward to, to having this conversation with you. Awesome. So I'm going to start right off. Who is David Dempsey? Uh, David Dempsey is a, um, is a, is a man who uh, you know, uh, grew, in, grew up in a housing project, uh, struggled as a young kid, and uh, uh, realized uh, through my mother, who was probably my only hero in my life, uh, that it, uh, it, sometimes it's better to be a giver than it is a taker. And to, um, you know, she always used to say to me, if you have a choice of being right or being kind, be kind. And so, you know, I, I, I really started out in life not really understanding who I was, or what I really wanted to do or accomplish and what, why, why, I'm, why am I here? And um, you know, as I look through my journey, um, you know, there were things in my life that changed my life and gave me some directions that came from places I'd never expected. And so as I started to realize who I wanted to be and what I wanted to do, you know, my, my life was taking two different paths. Hmm. Um, you know, I, I started out, you know, as a kid, like I said, in a housing project in Lynn, um, not much directions. You know, my family life was chaotic, kind of violent. My father was an alcoholic, but my mother was a uh, United States Army military woman who brought up uh, six kids in a housing project, mm -hmm. me and my five sisters. So, um, you know, and, and um, she, she set the groundwork and, mm -hmm. you know, um, she was the one who instilled values in me as a young man. Uh, that I still carry to this day with me. And so, uh, you know, I, and then, you know, what changed my life and what really found me, helped me find a purpose was I started to get involved in football and sports, uh, got away from the project life. A lot of the kids that I was, you know, lived with, hung around with, were going to Shirley Reform School. A lot of people don't remember that. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, the, you know, the struggles were different. So, you know, uh, so once I got involved in, in, in playing football and then started to realize that, you know, people look at you differently. You know, uh, you know, my name would be in the newspaper, and for a different reason. You know, uh, making a good play in a football game, or, or doing something. You know, you know, playing a good defense or something, yeah. or scoring points in a basketball game in a CYO basketball game. Yeah. So I started to separate myself and make yeah. decisions of where I really wanted to go yeah. in my life, and that's, um, you know, and. Hey, it's, coach, can I pause you for sure. a second? So, um, I want to give the audience a little context sure so we're talking late 1960s mid 60s late 60s we're talking about lynn massachusetts could you describe the time lynn massachusetts at that time because you mentioned the word projects right and i want to give people a sense of how you grew up and what lynn massachusetts and the projects were like back then right well i think in in, in 1969 you know i was uh a, junior, a senior in high school, elected captain of the football team. But there were, there were several projects in the city of Lynn which were really struggling. You know, I was in America Park, which was one of them, um, which it, it, it had really, you know, deteriorated in the time. What was the project? The, the, uh, it was a, the project was really a place where it, it started out as a veterans project for, for a, a subsidized housing for veterans, as my mother was. And it... it um, it ended up being a place where, um, it, um, you know, a lot of uh, trouble, violence, you know, a lot of uh, crime, ju juvenile crime, not a lot of direction for young kids, not a lot to do, you know, not a lot to do. 2,500 families in a, in, a, in, a, in a place where, you know, it was for kids, it was a great place to grow up because it was always, you know, there was always a fun game. There was always, you know, basketball. There was always something to do, but there was no direction for kids and uh, parents were struggling. And uh, some parents were struggling just to keep their kids out of trouble. Uh, it was a place that, uh, you know, m m one of my biggest, you know, fans later in life was Officer Roger White from the Lynn Police Department, mm -hmm. who used to pick me up at 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock at night and drive me home and drop me off mm -hmm. at my house to get in the house. So, you know, and that's what Lynn was like. You know, there was parts of Lynn you didn't go to. You know, you stayed away from and there was, uh, just to give you a little history, you know, I, I went to Lynn Class School, which was seven and a half miles from where I lived. And we took public transportation. Mm. You know, we had a bus ticket. You get on a bus with everybody going to work and guys smoking and, you know, everybody on the public transportation bus. 
and you get off the bus in Central Square and then walk to classical. You know, that's where how that's what life was. And, um, you know, that, so that's what the city of Lynn looked like then. There was the Green Street projects over on Chestnut Street. There was some other, you know, housing units in the, in the city. But um, it, it was, a, and the city was in tough shape at the time. Mm. You know, uh, Union Street was a difficult place. Um, you know, they, they started to try to do something in urban development downtown, and it really didn't work out well. Uh, the, Lynn was struggling. Yeah. Lynn was struggling. They were talking about closing schools and talking about doing things that were... Yeah. Um, we're, we're, we're not, you know, it, it wasn't a, it wasn't a thriving place at the time. Yeah. Difficult place to grow up. Yeah, that's helpful, Coach. And then you talked, uh, another key word you mentioned, um, your mother instilled values uh, the, in your life. Can you talk a little bit about what those values were? Sure. I, I mean, I'll, I'll give you an example. And I, and I was thinking about that today when I was driving over here. And I said, you know, my, my, one of the things that my mother did early on was she taught me how to be a man. And that sounds funny. My mother taught teaching me how to be a man. But I can remember we didn't have a car and we used to take the bus to go food shopping. And we'd take the bus to, there was a, there was a grocery store in Wyoming Square called National Food Chains. And we'd go there and we'd have to take the bus. And, and, and here I am, nine years old. We just moved from Bronx, New York, and I'm sitting on the bus. And, you know, all of a sudden the bus is full and there's a woman that comes on the bus and she's standing there. And my mother gives me one of these and says, get up. And I'm looking at my mother and saying, and she said, get up. Wow. And, and I get up and I stood up and I said to the lady, you can have my seat. And to that, to this day, if I'm in that situation, I still do that. Because there was something that I learned intrinsically that as much as I didn't want to give up my seat at that time, one of the things I did realize that when I gave that woman my seat, I felt better about myself. Mm. So automatically I, I, I said, wow. This makes me feel pretty good, you know. So I started to learn about leave, giving up, sacrificing. Right. And the other thing it did was everybody else on that bus looked at me differently. Because I was the young, the young man, the young boy that got up and gave a woman my seat. So as when it was time to get off the bus, you know, people were looking at me and smiling. The bus driver said thank you. So it, that taught me early on about understanding, you know, that... What, what the intrinsic feeling and the intr intrinsic gratification you get from giving and sacrificing something. So those were just some, that was just an example of how mm -hmm. she taught me. And it was a lesson that she didn't sit me down and say, you know, you're going to do this, 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 and this. It was, she allowed me to learn through the process yep. by telling me how to do the right thing. Yep. And so, you know, that was one of, the, that's, and, and again, when you talk about, you know, values and you talk about intrinsic feelings, you know, we're all brought onto this earth as innocent infants mm. and we know nothing, you know, we know nothing at all. And so everything we are from that point on, we're, we're taught and we learn. And um, so thank God I had a mother who was willing to teach me early on right from wrong and teach me the ability to, to judge myself and to be able to be, you know, to, to self-evaluate and look at myself and say, you know, did I do the right thing? Yep. And if I didn't do the right thing, step up and say I didn't do the right thing. So she was, she taught me that really early on. And that was one of the values that she, you know, she, and to this day, hmm. to this day, if I'm in public transportation, or I'm in one of the trains in the Boston or I'm on a bus somewhere, you know, I'm Disney World with my family and a lady standing up, I get up. And yeah. And I, and I offer my seat because, yeah. it, and that also brings me back memories of my mom. Mm -hmm. So that, that's just one of the examples. That's awesome, Coach. So the other piece that I want to make sure the, the, the audience and listeners catch here um, is the role that your mother played in instilling uh, leadership traits and manly traits yeah. in your upbringing. You talk a little bit about that in the context of today's society. Sure, I, you know, one of the things that that, that because I, I think I was the only boy in the family, um, I think my mother looked at me differently. I mm -hmm. think you know she knew that there were certain things that I had to to, to be familiarized with. That you know, and and one of the things that she taught me early on when it comes to to other people, and I think a lot of it had to do with my father. My father was not, you know, he was a he was a, a he was an alcoholic and he struggled throughout his whole life. But my mother told me early on, she said to me, David, she said, there's two things you learn from everybody you come in contact with. And she said to me, and one is how to be. And the other one is how not to be. Mm. And so, and I valued that through my whole life. 
So when I when I started to want it to be a, 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 a my thrive to be a football player, and I would see kids that players that weren't working hard at practice, and I'd see others that were, and I'd say to myself, that's how to be, and that's how not to be. When I became a coach and I saw how other coaches did things and how other adults treated kids and worked with youth, and I learned again how to be and how not to be. So that was something she told me when I was really young is that, you know, you can learn something from every person you come in contact with. And if you take those two things away and assess those and take the good with them and take the bad with them and understand which direction you want to go in, then I think, you know, people say that there's a cycle in alcoholism and there's a cycle in abuse and domestic abuse and things like that. But I think one of the things that I did learn from my father is how not to be. Mm. And I grew up as a man understanding the things that he did and learned from his mistakes because there were things he did that I knew as a dad, as a husband, you know, and as a, as a person that yeah. that's not the type of person that I wanted to be. So, and that's something that I've done my whole life. Mm. Even to, to, to this day, if I see somebody or I have a neighbor who does something and that's something that I don't appreciate, yeah. I don't become confrontational. I don't say anything, but in my own mind, I say, you know, that's something that I'm not going to do yeah. or I'm not going to be like. So I think that's one of the values that she gave me on how to be able to assess from somebody else yeah. and learn from somebody else's hard time and bring it into my own journey and allow me to make good yeah. decisions. So I appreciate that, Coach. So I, I know you really well, and I want to surface a couple of things that I that I um, that I really respect and, about you, and that helped me become a better man. Um, talk a little bit of, of if you don't mind, what role did sports, in particular football, play in your development? Um, how much of an influence was football as you were transitioning from you know junior high, high school, college, etc.? Well. First of all, I, you know, I think I've told you the story about how I got involved in football. You know, it was, um, you know, it wasn't my intent. I never, I was, you know, a kid from the projects and I went to a Pop Warner one day for my buddy who was getting his equipment. He asked me if I'd go with him and help him get, get it. And um, a, a gentleman by the name of Johnny Labraja, who was a lieutenant in the Lynn Police Department, was one of the volunteer coaches, came over and kind of said, hey, kid, what are you doing? I said, I'm just waiting for my friend. He said, why, you know, you want to play? And I said, yeah. And I, so he gave me the information. I brought it home, signed it. And, um, you know, a couple of weeks later, you know, where first time, you know, a lot of it was just running and stuff. And I said, I don't know if I like this, but it came time to have, you know, have, our con have contact. And, you know, and, and I, uh, you know, the first tackling drill we had when we, when I was allowed to let it all out, you know, it, I realized that I enjoyed the contact of the game. Yeah. It was. It allowed me to kind of vent some of my anger from the, my my home life and from other things yeah. in my life, and it gave me a good place to really kind of be a part of my life. And um, you know, football has been a part of my life yeah. for my whole life. So you know, so it, from that time on, I never really been away from football yeah. as far as a player or a coach. Um, and so from there, you know, here I am, a young kid, and, and I go into the middle school, and, and again, I'm still this kid from the projects. Yep. And, you know, unfortunately, we had labels. You know, yep. we were labels back then. And, you know, we talk about, you know, being being labeled. And, and, and so, you know, even in school, I was, the, you know, the kid, you know, from the projects. And I went to Corbett Junior High School, which was on the other side of the city. Yep. And it was kind of crazy. So, uh, you know, we, again, we traveled to public transportation. And, um, uh, you know, when, when I was in middle school, Again, people started to look at me and say, you know, gee, he's different from the from the from a lot of the kids. You know, he's 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 different. He handles himself different. And I remember my sister Paula, who was brilliant. She's just she was she, and and, and you know, I always followed her in, in in school. And I can remember the teachers used to say to me, "Well, we know who's got the brains, and we know who's got the bronze," because <laughs> I was never a great student. Yeah. But, uh, um, you know, so now I, I, I go into high school and I'm still, you know, football is just kind of like my venting place. It's not something that I really think is, is going to set the tone for yeah. my life. Yeah. Um, you know, and as a sophomore, I'm the only sophomore out of the, um, out of the, the, uh, the whole football team that got my Letterman sweater as a sophomore. Wow. So now it kind of strikes me differently that, gee, you know, maybe this, this is something I can be pretty good at because I'm playing now, I'm 14 years old. A sophomore in high school and I'm playing with 17, 18 year old guys and, and I'm, I'm, I'm playing a lot. And then I get my Letterman sweater. And then the following year, my junior year, I get elected captain. And, you know, back then we only had one captain. So mm. my senior year, I'm, you know, captain of the football team. I'm participating in track. And, um, you know, I couldn't play three sports. Mm. I would have loved to have played baseball, but I had to work. I had a job, wow. you know, and, um, you know, I worked at Monty's Pizza from the time I was 14 years old all through high school. 
Um, and I, you know, I, I, it, and I never said, my mother never said a word. I, I made $125 a week and I would put $100 a week on the table for my mother and for, the, for our family. Because we, that's what we needed. You know, we had, you know, it, it was, uh, that was the way we, we survived. You know, mm -hmm. all of us, my sisters all went to work, you know, as sophomores and juniors in high school and we all contributed as a family. Yeah. So when we talk about, you know, values, just to go back a little bit on that, I can remember we had one Christmas where my mother came to all of us and said, look, you know, we don't have enough money for a, for a Christmas tree and a bunch of presents, um, but we can either have a Christmas tree and one present or we can all have a nice big dinner together. Mm. And all we all chose the dinner. Wow. So, and I realized then that, again, it's another piece of understanding values, you know, mm -hmm. that it was better for us to sit at a table, enjoy a good Absolutely. meal and have a nice time rather than have all the material things at Christmas. So, and again, going back to football was, you know, I realized that, you know, all of a sudden, you know, George Moriarty, who was my head coach, um, was an older, old school coach, calls me into the room one day and it's after the season. And he says to me, what are you going to do about college? Or what are you going to do about next year? And I really didn't have a clue. I didn't have an, you know, I didn't have a clue. And, and um, wasn't sure what I was going to do. And, um, you know, my, my mother and I talked about several things. But, yeah. you know, financially, my plan was to go out and find a job right. just to help the family because I had still had two younger sisters. And, and so um, he mentioned that, you know, I was only 17. I turned 17 my senior year. And he said, yeah. you know, let's talk about prep school. Yeah. So I went to a year of prep school, which was great. Um, had, a, had a scholarship to, um, to Cardinal Christian Academy, and then uh, I also had a scholarship to Idaho State in Pocatello, Idaho. Um, but I did make a choice to go to Boston State instead. And one of the reasons was, was, again, looking at my family. But I think the other thing that in my life that I, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention was, you know, I started dating my wife when I was 14 years old. Wow. You know, Carol and I... Um, were Mr. and Mrs. Lynn Classical in 1970, you know? <laughs> and so when we talk about developing as a young man, um, that also gave me a whole nother person in my life and a, actually another family with her mom and her dad and her sister that I wanted to make proud of me. Yeah. I wanted to, to let them know that, you know, I'm a good person and I'm worthy of, you know, marrying yeah. your daughter someday. So there were things in my life that I had focused on that, you know, allowed me to, to process decision making and always say, I don't want to dis I certainly don't want to disappoint my mom. Yep. And I also don't want to disappoint Carol, who yeah. was an important part of my life, you know. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it, so as I transitioned through, you know, when I graduated and then, you know, I, I went to Boston State. I didn't finish my get my degree right away. I went and worked construction and had a job and we got married and I bought my first house when I was 22 years old. Wow. And um, so, you know, and then I realized... I, I want to go back a little bit. There's, sure. There's some important pieces here. The first piece I want to, I want to touch base on is there were foundational pillars. So I talk, let me step back in the book, one of, I talk about core issues like faith, family, perseverance, grit. The name of this series is called Grit Machine DNA. One of the things that uh, we're covering here, and I want to make sure we, we cover it in detail and surface it, the first part is um, foundational values that started to define who you were, right? I talk about moments that define you in the book. There were some defining pieces here. Your mother's role in your life. There was your coaches. There was the police officer. There were key people, your circumstances in the projects. There were key people and circumstances that could have either influence you in one way, right? The streets, violence, jail, etc. or could have taken or took you in, in your case in a very different direction. And so what I want to highlight here is that there were foundational elements, people and values that took you in a specific direction. Right? How does that happen? Um, well, it happens because there's certain things that you do in your life. There's certain good things that you do when you get praise and gratification and there's certain things you do when you make mistakes. I'll tell you a quick story when I was about 11, 12 years old. <clears throat> when I lived in, in, in America Park, out behind us on the Saugus line, there was a farmer. Mm. And he, um, he had tomatoes and he had all kinds of crops. And, he had, and one, one, one night, a bunch of us got together and we decided we were going to go raid the farmer's farm. Mm. And um, so we went over, it was about 10 or 11 o'clock at night, and we kind of got in there and we got tomatoes. We were throwing tomatoes at each other. And, he came running out and my friend 
we went to take off and my friend got caught on the fence and I tried helping him get him uncaught from the fence and the farmer caught us. Mm. And um, the police came and uh, they took me to my house and uh, brought me home and my mother looked at me and I knew she didn't, she didn't say anything. She said, go upstairs and you know, go to bed. We'll talk about this in the morning. And the next morning, she came up, it was about 6.30 in the morning, she woke me up and she said, get up, get dressed, let's go. I said, where are we going? She goes, we're going to the farmer, Mr. I forget what his name was, but we're going to see him. And uh, she marched me down, the Fair, it was down Fairview Ave, marched me down and knocked on his door. It was about 8 o'clock in the morning on a Saturday, and she looked at him and she said, this is David. She said, he was here last night. And uh, she, said, uh, she said, he's going to uh, spend the rest of the summer working for you. Wow. And, uh, <laughs> which is, wow. you know, and, and so, she, and, and, you know, she looked at me and I'm like, you know, and, and she said, uh, she said, he's going to do this because he owes you because he made a bad decision and he needs to make it right. Mm. So six weeks, six weeks, I'd spend three hours in the morning during my summer going down and helping him. And, but you know what, David, what came out of it was every day when I went home, I went home with two shopping bags full of food. Wow. So, wow, <laughs> you know, what a blessing. When you look back, that's how I learned about, you know, being accountable. That's how I learned about responsibility. Yes. You know, it was I made a bad decision yep. and I learned at that point in time, but out of it came, yep. you know, something good. Out of it Absolutely. came the gratification that this gentleman had, that my mother had the courage. Absolutely. And out of all of us, she was the only one that marched me back to that man's house. Wow. And that's when I knew she was different and we were different. Yep. You know, and I realized then that that's the direction I wanted to go yeah. in. And, uh, you know, and, I, and for two summers after that, yeah. I would check in with him and help him. And he was always sending food to our house. Wow. You know, we'd get, he'd send us squash, he'd send us cucumbers, tomatoes. But every day when I'd come home, I'd come home with two bags of food because wow. he, he couldn't, he, he couldn't, you know, use it all himself. He had yeah. a little bit of a, uh, you know, a, a food stand, a little, you know, farmer stand out front. Um, but so wow. that was a lesson that I've learned. I've never forgotten it. Yeah. And so it's not, you know, we all make mistakes, but it's, it's, it, it, I learned that day, you know, yeah. that when you make a bad decision that yeah. you need to process it, you yeah. need to realize that it was a mistake and you need to be man enough to yeah. step up and own, own your peace. Yep. Yeah. And, um, you know, that's, so that's what, that's the way my mother taught me things. Yeah. Those were, she, she never yelled or raised her voice at me. She never punished me in, yep. in ways that, you know, you're in for, you know, you're going to stay in for the, for the summer. You have to be in every day. No, she marched me down there and made me wow. make good for what I did wrong. And so wow. that was, a, that was a lesson about values. You yeah. Know? Coach, you know, it's funny. I'm going to get into some dangerous territory here. Um, you know, given today's context of cancer culture and social justice, um, you know, my story, it's documented in the book. You better than most people other than my family know my history. Um, but there's some lessons here um, that I want to surface and just spend a few minutes on. You mentioned personal responsibility. You mentioned accountability. In today's discussion of social media, etc., there's sort of this the discussion of like blaming the environment, but not the individual. Um, and here we are talking about two people who, again, through values, people have were helped to make the right decisions and choices. Can you spend a few minutes, let's spend a few minutes talking about how does that happen? Is it the environment that essentially defines who you are or is it the individual, family, et cetera? How do we talk about that today given the negative culture we're facing? Well, I, I see, I think in, in my opinion, and, and I firmly believe the environment sets the stage for all of us, for all of us. And I think that the individual chooses how he or she responds to the environment. Yeah. And, you know, you have to, if you believe in something and, and you feel that, you know, that your beliefs are right and you believe in them strong enough, then I think that, 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 that that's how you respond to the environment. Um, there's things going on in our lives right now. And as and I may be old school, but, you know, there's things happening that I don't approve of, you know. Uh, there's things that are taking place in this country right now that I think, you know, there's a sense of entitlement. Uh, there's a sense of, like you said, um, blaming, uh, you know, others and blaming the environment and a lot of finger pointing going on. Um, 
but I think what 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 has to happen is that you know as young men and young women, I think we have to look at ourselves and you know the mirror is a good tool, <laughs> and some of us should spend more time in the mirror looking at and self evaluating ourselves yep. and seeing what you know what how are we contributing yeah. what are we contributing to yeah. what's going on in our yeah. society and um so I think I think the 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 environment sets the stage and sets the tone of our lives. Yeah. But I think it's how we respond as individuals, yeah. um, and, and and I really think that we do have to be accountable. I think when we just the same way that you know, and I think one of the things that happens in this country now, and I'm going to take it from a perspective as a coach in sports, you know, everybody needs to get a participation trophy, you know, and I think what happens is is that you know, and nobody can get cut from the from from a from right. a sporting, uh, you know. Well, like I said before, you know, when I first played Pop Warner, there was one Pop Warner in the city of Lynn. There was one team, 44 of us for the whole city. 200 and something kids would try out. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of them would get cut. You know, um, I was fortunate. I didn't, you know. And so, but there were a lot of kids went home crying. Yeah. And, um, you know, in the two years that I played in Pop Warner and the junior high school team I played on, those kids would come back the following year and try and be better. They'd be better at it. They would have worked. They would have. It would have been something that they wanted to strive for. Right. If every kid makes the team, what 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 sets the tone to work harder or be better? Exactly. You know, um, I was I was very friendly with Ron Burton, mm -hmm. uh, and it's, Ron Burton was an unbelievable man, just yeah. a great man, and he's got you know some great sons that are still on TV. Former football former, star. Former and... football star. And I can remember he tells the story about he got cut from his high school football team as a freshman. Now, his man wow. that went on was... The, I did not know that. Oh, yeah. And, and um, his grandmother, he lived with his grandmother, and his grandmother said to him, you know, Ron, you know, he came home, he was crying, and she said to him, you can do one of two things. You can spend the rest of your time crying every time you go to a football field because you're not playing, or you can start working to get better. And he didn't know how to get better. So what he did was he just got up and he started to run in the morning. Mm -hmm. And... He didn't. He ran by every single kid on the high school football team's house, but he wow. did it at four thirty in the morning. Wow! And he never knew, but it came out to seven miles, a little over seven miles, and he calls it the seven mile run of his life. And so, you know, what he did was he came back as a sophomore, made the football team. He played in the last game of the season and scored three touchdowns. He was a starting tailback in his junior year uh, at, in high school. Um, Led second in the nation in Russian, senior in high school. He was being recruited by everybody in the country. Wow. And uh, Woody Hayes, he was he lived in Ohio, Columbus, Ohio. So Woody Hayes, he was always at the, high, the mm -hmm. Ohio State games. And and he tells the story about Ara Pasizian, who was the head coach at Northwestern. Northwestern mm -hmm. had lost 33 games in a row. Mm -hmm. And uh, Woody Hayes came to his house in the recruiting. And then one day there was a knock on the door, and it was Ara Pasizian. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was the head coach at Northwestern. And he, he, uh, he went in, he talked to Ron Burton, and Ron Burton listened to him and said, yeah, yeah, okay, thank you. And he, he went, when, when Arab Pasijan left, he shut the door and he said, I'm not going there. They haven't won a game in 33 games. And his grandmother looked at him and said, Ron, it's better to be wanted than it is to be needed. Wow. What and a so, message. So he thought about it, and he, he uh, two days later, he called Arab Pasijan and said he was going to Northwestern. His first year, they won two games. His second year at Northwestern, they won eight games, lost two. One of the losses went to Ohio State. His junior year, they went nine and one, lost to Ohio State for the national championship. And his senior year, they beat Ohio State for the national championship. Wow. He was the first person drafted by the New England Patriots. Back then, they were the Boston yeah, Patriots. Boston. So he tells this story uh -huh. about, uh, you know, the best thing that happened to him was when he got cut from the football team yeah. because it, it gave him a goal. It set a tone for him yeah. to overcome yeah. a deficiency. He wasn't good enough at first, yeah. but he worked to make himself better. Yeah. And so I, I think with, with the culture that we're in now where there's a lot of entitlement, there's a lot of parents who, who, uh, who really, instead of holding their children accountable, um, try to help them figure out ways to, to avoid responsibilities right. and avoid accountability. Um, and, and I think that's, that's part of our problem right now. And I think one of the things that's missing in, in our culture right now is, you know, there's no more family dinners. People don't sit down as a family and talk about things and have the communication. The only communication is family is there's a note stuck on the refrigerator. You know, I'll be home at five, make sure you put this on for supper, do this, make sure you do your homework and do this. And we've lost that basic family unit, which I think 
you know, years ago, we could sit at the table no matter how tough things were. Dinner was at five o'clock and I knew that no matter where I was, you know. So I think there's things that are missing in our lives, yeah. you know. So yeah. I'm gonna, I'm, we're, we're going to transition right to there, right. family. Yeah. There was a powerful story you shared earlier about the options and I'm going to call them trade-offs because yeah. right? I, I believe that life is largely about trade-offs, faith and trade-offs. Um, your mother sat you and your sisters down and said, we don't have enough money for either gifts or dinner. Right. So what do you guys want to do? Can you, let's talk about family. Right. How does a mother sit her children down at that those ages and have that conversation, which by the way, I don't see happening today in some right. homes. Right. How, did, how did that, how did it get there? And what, what does that mean from a family values perspective and instilling those values on their kids? Well, I think, I think what, in our situation, you know, it, it was neither or, and we had to make a decision. You know, we didn't, my mother had no credit cards. My mother, you know, we lived day by day, week by week. And, um, and, and thank God she was as strong as she was. So, but you know, that conversation, I've never forgotten it. Mm. And that's why when I, you know, when I, when I, when I lived in Lynn and I was coaching, I was in the Lynn school systems. I used to have a Christmas Eve at my house and 50 or 60 people would, were invited. Everybody would come. Because I realized that, you know, it, you know, I had my, my, I remember the three McKenzie brothers, Dexter, Seymour, and Lincoln at my house on Christmas Eve, yep. you know, and, 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 <laughs> and, and I remember, you know, having those people there because I wanted to let people yeah. know that, you know, that I wanted to share that moment yeah. because I know that, that, you know, that some people don't have that ability. That's right. And uh, so to me, what I felt like when, when I was coaching and when I was teaching and when I was, you know, in special education, and I'll talk about special education and, and my role in that, is um, people became my extended family. And that was where, you know, when, when people would say, well, you know, what do you mean you took six kids in a van and brought them down to Duke and brought them to North Carolina? Because, you know, those kids became part of my extended family. Yeah. And, and, and I felt that, you know, that, that a lot of people who don't have a family unit, sometimes a person like me can reach out. Um, and, and, and give them an opportunity to feel as though they do have a family. Yeah. Even though if it looks different, it might be, you know, we, it might be three, I might, one might be a Latino, one might be, uh, you know, uh, an African-American, one might be, you know, so it, it's a mixture of people. It yeah. didn't matter. Yeah. It didn't matter. And that never mattered to me. And I think when we go back to growing up in the housing project, I think that was the other thing that, that sensitized me to, to, to people of, of different, different ethnic backgrounds and, and different religious backgrounds. Because no one cared. It didn't yeah. matter. You know, my best friend was a, was a gentleman by the name of Haki Tyler. And his dad, they were, you know, he, you know, I slept over his house. He slept over my house. And it didn't, you know, I never saw college. Yeah. So I think that was the other experience yeah. I had from growing up in Lynn and growing up in that environment. Is that, um, to me, it, it was, it, we, we were people. That's all. Yeah, what's you remarkable, know? Coach, is, you know, if you, if you look at data, you have... From, 19, from the early 60s, you had two family homes for black families of over two-thirds, right? Mm -hmm. Roughly the data, over 60%, uh, both father and mother in the home. Today, that's less than 25%. Right. Hispanics, over 80% in the early 60s. Today, it's less than 50%. Yeah. So the role of family in building values and in helping you in your in your in, uh, circumstances navigate how to be how not to be personal responsibility accountability the rule of family is foundational and part of what i assess from a lot of the kids that i played football with went to college with that's a massive missing element i mean you talked about today a lot of folks do sticky notes on the fridge don't even talk no family dinners um there is a serious to me my personal perspective on this, family is foundational in how you build strong men and women with core values. Um, and from my point of view, that's a big, big missing element in many families across America. Right. I, I think, you know, and, and I think one of the things that, that you know, like I said, I, I, I think I'm unique in a way. I mean, I, I met Carol when we were 14 years old and, yeah. you know, we went through college together, high school together, and, you know, we've been together. And, um, I think the other thing that's broken down is the, is the commitment to marriage. You know, mm. I think it's easier for, for, and I think that's part of, that's part of, that's when, when, when that started to break down, 
and became more common. I mean, I think it's very, from now on, when you see someone who's been married 50 years, it's, it's, that's unique. Yeah. And I think what, ha so I think the whole structure of family is completely different. I don't think there's the unit anymore. I think it's a family of, of individuals that come together when there's a, when there's a crisis or when there's a need um, or when someone, you know, is it, when there's, a, there's an issue that's going on, whether it's a health yeah. issue or whether yeah. someone's, and I, and I think that's when families come together. But I think other than that, um, it, they're pretty stagnant they're, yeah. and, they're, and, they're, and they become individuals yeah. pretty quickly, you yeah. know. Um, yeah. uh, so, but, but, but what it's done, Coach, and I, my, again, my personal perspective is the place where you're learning your values, your grit, your perseverance, if you build any, is has been relegated to either schools, universities, or the street. Right, right. Um, and that is a, that's an observation that I continue to make when I have conversations with young men and women um, in high school today. That there's a missing part here. Sure. They're not getting some of their values where historically I got them. Right, my parents, yeah. you, um, and so to me that's a really important point of uh, your story. Yeah, and, and I think when we when we talk about you know, when, as a society, when we start relying on our public school systems or our private school systems or, you know, our, our, our other institutions to teach our children core values, um, that's a missed opportunity. Um, because really, I think that's the ultimate responsibility of a parent yeah. is to be able to um, instill in your children, um, you know, what's right and wrong to teach yeah. them right and wrong and help them to make good decisions. Yeah. And when they fall off and they make a bad decision to, to really be able to hold them accountable and really show them how to, how, you know, that this is the effect it has on you and this is how you need to fix it. Yeah. Um, so if we're relying on institutions and, and, you know, and most of our churches have broken down. Yeah. Um, so that's not a big part of people's lives anymore. Yeah. So I think we're in a situation right now where we're asking our young people to go learn on their own. Yeah. Um, and you know, and, and I'm not knocking anything. I'm not knocking. But when you talk about our social medias that are on, on Facebook and on yeah. TikTok and all of these yeah. things, um, they have, they have a great purpose and they have a wonderful purpose, but they also have a downside. Mm. And so again, it's about decisions. And I think, so I think, I think we've lost that ability, mm -hmm. um, to have a solid family unit for yeah. our young people to learn their values. And we're asking, society itself yeah. and other places to help instill those yeah. values on our kids and, yeah. and, and, and they're failing. Yeah. They're failing. I want to go back to, uh, um, your Christmas Eve dinners and you mentioned the McKenzie brothers. Um, so just to give people, uh, the listeners and audience some, some context, um, coach Dempsey coach, people, kids like me, Hispanics, blacks, uh, low income, poor white kids, etc. low income, Hispanics, low income, blacks, etc. The McKenzie brothers were a set of black brothers, um, and I know them well, appreciate them, uh, still talk to a couple of them. Can you talk a little bit about um, your time as a coach, and this is all has to do with family and extended family, and your role in shaping my life. Can you talk a little bit about how you viewed your responsibility as a coach for kids like me, like the McKenzies, like the Echeverias, yeah. etc.? You know... Um, I really felt that my role, uh, especially at Lynn Class School, you know, I, I, being gradu a graduate of Lynn Class School and, and understanding the environment, um, you know, I felt that, um, you know, coaching, coaching football, I, I always felt coaching football was, was a tool that I could use to bring young men together to help and set a tone to help them become better men so that as they moved on in life, they had a good anchor. And, uh, you know, I know that there, there, there wasn't a lot of structure in a lot of some of the kids' homes. And it wasn't their fault and it wasn't their parents' fault. Their parents did the best they could with what they had. Yeah. Uh, and that's how I felt about my mother. So I was never judgmental. Um, I never blamed the parent for someone, you know, for, for something that, you know, one of our players did or didn't do, um, you know. So it, I really felt that my role as a coach... Uh, didn't end after, on Thanksgiving or end when you know in a Super Bowl game or tur tournament or anything. I felt that my role as a coach was was really about helping young men become better men, but also by giving them a, a, a path yeah. to be able to show them. 
um, you know, take these steps and giving them an opportunity. And then it was their choice from that point on to build on those opportunities. Yeah. And um, so I felt that it was important that, you know, as a, as a coach, um, because, you know, there's the old saying, you know, you know, coaches can get kids to do things that parents can't. And it's true. And I used to have parents call me, you know, call me up or come by the school and say to me, you know, I can't even get them to take out the trash. How can you get them to do this or show up at seven o'clock in the morning to, you know, to do seven on sevens before school? Yeah. And I used to say to them, it's very simple. I, I, I own play. I own the playing time. Yeah. So, you know, if they want to play that they're going to, you know, so, um, but the, but knowing that, knowing that I, um, I, I, I I was able to to really help kids in a different way and, mm -hmm. and understand to, there was a there's a part of me that I needed to to do what someone did for me. Yeah. You know, my football coach did, did, did you know, extended me and said, you, you know, took me aside and said, you know, you're going to do this. You know, I felt at that point in time, it was a responsibility for me to do the same because I know how it impacted me. Yeah. I know how it changed my life. And I said to myself, I, I have that same tool that he had. Mm. I have that same tool and I need to use it the same way that he did. Um, you know, I can remember, you know, getting a letter from my fifth grade teacher. Um, and and he, he sent me a letter when I got elected captain at Lynn Law School. And he said that it was nice to see uh, uh, one of my guys from the project's name because he was a teacher at Callahan School. And uh, yeah. he said uh, it was yeah. nice to see one of my guys from the project's name yeah. in the newspaper <laughs> and not on the police log. And so, you know, it, it was those things that, that started, but somebody, somebody mm -hmm. had to stop their life and give and show me the path. Yep. Um, you know, people would say to me, you know, you, you know, you drove a kid to, to, to his college visits. Yeah, I drove it to yeah. college visits. You know, uh, you know, there's, there's, I could tell stories about things that, that I've done for kids that, you know, that, that, that go on and on and on, you know, uh, and, and I don't think coaches do that nowadays. Mm -hmm. I don't think that coaches, I think coaches show up, they coach and they go home. And that's, I'm not being critical of yeah. that. Yeah. Um, but, but, and, 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 and I, you know, but I just felt that that's what changed my life yeah. was my, my football coach and the people in my life gave me direction and stepped in and helped me make decisions and give, gave me opportunities. And just, and I felt that it was my responsibility to do that for the, the yeah. same, you know, I, I, I've been to kids' houses, I've sat yeah. with kids' parents, uh, you know, and, and I've talked to them about what's best for their, yeah. for their kids. And, and um, I, I just felt that that was yeah. part of my role. So coach there, so in the book, I talk about how uh, you played a transformative part of my life. You uh, essentially through football took me off the streets. Essentially, my parents were working two and three jobs. Um, and you were essentially the extended family that I that I needed at the time in my high school life. Um, but you weren't just doing this for me. You were doing this for virtually almost every one of the folks I played with. Mm. Um, you drove us to colleges. You encouraged us to apply to a college to do better, be better, think bigger. I remember one time you brought in a, uh, I forget the gentleman's name, but when the gentleman left to give us a pep talk, one of the first things you said was remember how he spoke. He never said, uh, mm, uh, remember that. Right. Don't listen to the folks on TV doing that. Mm -hmm. Speak clearly. I never forgot that lesson. Another lesson on the field, I'll spend the stories out in the book, but you said people don't have to believe what you say. They have to believe what you do. And I live by that mantra today. Um, you did this for a bunch of poor white kids, poor blacks, poor Hispanics. Why? Well, because uh, you know, his because I, I I always looked at a at players, and there were certain players that I said, you know, they they're gonna they're fine, get out of the way and let them go. Yeah. There were other players that, that I felt that it was my job to connect the dots yeah. in the journey of each player. And I looked at each player and I said, okay, what dots are missing? Hmm. They they don't have a ride to college. What dots are missing? They don't have the money for an application. What dots missing? You know, they, they don't they don't they can't decide what school they want to go to. What dots missing? They need to sit down and figure out where to go and how to get there. Um, you know, there was a time when I would take, like I said, five or six players in a van and take them down south because, as a kid growing up, before anybody introduced the rest of the world to me, I just thought the you know the, the projects America Park Housing right. Project was was life. <laughs> you know, and when I saw things on TV, to me they weren't real. There was yeah. that was somebody else's world. <laughs> 
So it, I really felt that it was important to show them that this world is out there. Mm. You know, I can remember taking Lex Thornton and Joffrey Boyd, um, Nicio Echeverria and, and James Ball yeah. down to Duke University yeah. and visiting Duke University with them. And we stayed in a hotel, you know, and then we went from there. We went to um, we went to North, North Carolina State and then we went to University of North Carolina. We went to University of Maryland. University of, as we came back, Delaware, yeah, James man. Madison, right up the coast, went to colleges. And I once had somebody say, you know, why, why are you doing that? What are you, because, and what I said to them was that I can remember Lex Thornton walking out in the middle of the stadium yeah. at the University of North Carolina and looking up and seeing Lawrence Taylor's number retired up on mm. that podium and him staring around saying, wow, I'd love to come to a place like this. Wow. You know? And, and, you know, it, it, and so what it did was, and Lex ended up at BU and yep. played football at BU and yep. took BU to a national championship. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, and it, it was introducing him to that outside world that is available to him yep. was what gave him, you know, Joffrey went to UNH, yep. James Ball went to King's College yep. down in Pennsylvania. Yep. And it was it, it, what instilled that to them at a young age. I mean, I took yep. them when they were sophomores because yep. I saw something and I said, but these kids need to see what's out there, mm -hmm. you know? And so that was what I felt was important for yep. those kids. And again, I talk about connecting the dots and what was missing, what dot was missing yeah. to allow these kids to get to the next dot in the mm -hmm. next part of their journey. So every kid, was, every player was different. You know, every player was, was, it was a totally different thing. Mm -hmm. I can remember taking Seymour McKenzie to Butler Junior College down yeah. in El Dorado, Texas. You know, so mm -hmm. it, it was, there were certain parts of each, each player mm -hmm. in their lives that were missing. You know, yeah. uh, we talk about the McKenzie and, you know, one thing about them is they had a great, an unbelievable mother. You know, yeah. she took care of those boys and they went yep. to church every Sunday and yep. she, so that wasn't an element that was missing, yep. but there were other things. And that, yep. I felt that that was my role to fill yep. those, fill in those dots. That's awesome coach. Um, I want to talk about grit and perseverance. Yep. One of the, um, really crucial moments in my life. I talk about moments that define you. I talk about influential people in my life. You're one of them. Um, but one of the moments that defined me, and I, this gets to grit and perseverance, I remember um, my first week in college. I went to Bowdoin College, et cetera, thanks to you. Um, I remember calling you and my father, um, and I used to cry, cry after I got off the phone. And here is this, you know, 235 plus pound linebacker alone in his room. And I remember you said to me, this will be, if you decide to stay here, this will be the greatest decision you've ever made for your family, okay? That and those conversations with you and my father helped me to think about my future in a very different way. I have to be tough and I have to persevere through this. As much as I hate being here, I have to figure this out. I wanna talk about grit and perseverance. Part of what I used to respect and really admire you still do about you is, man, this guy's tough. This guy sat me on my butt one time in a locker room when I challenged you and you put me in the, mm. in the locker within one second. Uh, talk, I want to talk about grit, perseverance. How does one develop grit, tenacity, perseverance? How does that happen? Well, I, I, think, it, I think it, first of all, I, I think you have to look at it as an individual and what, you know, we're, we're, we're all going to be faced with challenges in our lives, yep. okay? And, you know, I always looked at it and said there's two ways to handle a challenge. You know, you can either avoid it or you can take it head on. Right. And, and I really feel that, you know, that there, there's a reason that challenge is in front of you. Mm. And if you can overcome that, I'm going to tell you another, you know, a, a common uh, theme and a common saying my mother used to always say to me. When I, was not, when I was younger, I could never understand it. The prettiest flowers grow in the valleys. Mm. And I, 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 you know, I always look at her and, you know, I'd say, Ma, come on, we have flowers. What are you talking about? But as I got older, I understood that, you know, that the prettiest flowers grow in the valleys means that when you're down in your life and you're in your lowest points, that's when you're growing and that's when you're becoming the strongest. Mm. So when you think about flowers in the valleys, that's where the water is. But, you know, at the top of the mountain where everybody's doing great and you're doing fine, you're really not getting stronger and you're not learning much mm. because you're really on, you're, you're on pilot, you know, you're autopilot. Yep. Things are going great, you know. But when you're when you're facing a challenge and, and you're knocked down, 
um, that's when you grow. That's when you get stronger. So, so my mother always used to say the prettiest flowers grow in the valleys. And I, <laughs> until I got older and, and was faced with diversity and faced with challenges and, you know, and, and, and I started to have a family and going through the challenges of, of having a family and going through, you know, um, you know, the, just life's challenges. Mm -hmm there'd be times when I'd be down and that saying would come back and mean a lot to me. And I'd say, you know what, I'm getting stronger. And there's the old saying, if it doesn't make you stronger, you know, if it doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger. Yeah. But she always presented it to me that yeah. way. Yeah. And to this day, I still say that, you know, the prettiest yeah. flowers grow in the valleys because it really is about, you know, that's when, when you're, when you're in a challenge and things aren't going right for you in your life, there's two yeah. things, like I said, you can give up and walk yeah. away. Or you can take that challenge on and you're yeah. going, that challenge is going to make you a bigger person, a better yeah. person, a stronger person, and it's going to allow you to be yeah. and get to where you want to be in life. Yeah. So I love your comment, too, because it ties back to something you said earlier about, you know, social, the social issues today. A lot of the young men and women are not being given the opportunity to, to have these difficult moments, right, to, to struggle and build that resilience and grit, etc. Um, you know, it reminds me of another point in my life. Um, where uh, you showed up at my house. I had a 103 degree fever the night before. I still had about 102 the morning of, and you showed up with Coach Alakuda uh, at our doorstep and <laughs> basically said, look, Mr. Morales, Mr. Morales, he has to play. <laughs> and I'll never forget you come into the bedroom and saying, get in the shower, here's a, here's a gallon of orange juice, you're gonna play. Right. This is gonna make you tougher. Right. I never right. forgot it, right. never forgot it. Right. Um, those traits, that type of tenacity and grit, I agree with you, develop over time, over tough circumstances. How, what's a, how do we help young folks think about to today at a time when everything is about uh, entitlement, victimhood, you owe me something? How, how, do, we, how do we advance that today? I, I, I think the way that, that, that we advance, I think that as, as a society, it, we really have to get back to the fact that... that Young people, and, and, and when I say young people, you know, I'm talking as early as 9, 10 years old up until 20, 25. You know, it, there has to be a time in our lives when, when we, we slowly get prepared yeah. for the big challenges as we get older. Because mm -hmm. they come. You know, when, when you, you know, I lost my mother when she was 65 years old, and that was devastating. But I knew I had to get through it, and I lost her on a Thanksgiving morning. Wow. And we had a football game. You know, and, and you know, the, the funny thing about it is she died at two o'clock in the morning on Thanksgiving morning mm. and it, we, the Thanksgiving game had never been canceled or postponed. I went to bed at about three. There was no snow on the ground. When I woke up in the morning to seven o'clock to go up in the locker room, there was five inches of snow and they ended up postponing the game. Wow. But the challenges in life as kids get older, if we don't allow them to be able to handle the small challenges, and this is why I say to parents all the time. Failure is not is, is is failure is part of life, and it's how you handle your failures and how you handle you know how you get knocked down is is and get back up yeah. is part of what makes us bigger and stronger. Yeah. And so when you when people when parents are overprotective or parents allow their, their their young children or their adolescents or their teenagers or their you know their twenty year old children to avoid. Um, to, to avoid challenges and to, to feel as though, oh, don't, I'll take care of it or everything gets taken care of things. There's going to come challenges later on in that person's life where they're, gonna, they're, never, they're not going to be able to stand up to it. And that's, yeah. it's about preparedness. Yes. You know, it's about you know, understanding that you know, if, you, if you have a commitment and it, you, you have a responsibility to fulfill that commitment. Yeah. So um, you know, we went to that, that veterans breakfast and I thought it was amazing. And I looked around all those men and women who, who made a commitment to the United States Army and to us and to America mm -hmm. to protect us and to keep us safe. Yep. And can you imagine if the first time they had a challenge, they walked away or they called their mom and dad and said, hey, can you help me get me out of this mess? You know, so it's really about yep. allowing the small failures when they're eight, nine, ten years old, mm -hmm. and the accountability is when they're younger that prepares them for the larger challenges mm -hmm. in life. And I, I think that's what we're missing. We're missing yeah. that right now. And how do we get back to it? I think we get back to it by working in groups such as you and, and myself and, and working with in, in places such as athletics and coaching. And, and, and you know, when I, when I turn on the TV and I see fights at hockey games and I see things going on in locker rooms at some of the high schools and stuff, it, to me, 
there's there's a missing link in a lot of different areas right now that has to be reconnected. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And uh, I totally agree, Coach. You know, it's funny. We were so we hosted a veterans breakfast um, uh, for Veterans Week, um, and we had the great pleasure of uh, having the North Shore Chamber of Commerce, the National Guard, uh, and incredible people help us uh, prepare that event. Uh, our keynote speaker, Kyle Lamb, Sa- Sergeant Major Kyle Lamb, uh, retired, Special Forces, etc. One of the key things that we talked about that morning was, A, understanding your mission, right. B, competing against yourself, yourself. no one else, right. competing against yourself, and then three, staying in the fight. Right. Um, now, I'm gonna, I, I want to tackle each one of those from your point of view, M- knowing and understanding the mission. Most people don't understand what their mission in life is. No, they don't. And when they and and sometimes when they do, it's too late. When they find that it's too late. Mm-hmm. And, but I think, see, I think a mission is 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 it's it's self established. Mm-hmm. Uh, your, your true mission comes from within. Mm-hmm. And and you know, I'll give you an example of what happened in my life that kind of split me in two different directions. Mm-hmm. Um, when I was nineteen years old, I took the t- the police exam, and. Um, you know, I, I had scored a good score on the exam, you know, 99.7 on the exam, and I was fourth in the line for the call for the Lynn Police Department, fourth in the line to go to the academy. And um, what happened was the Civil Service Department came out and they established a priority list and they went preferences and they mm-hmm. went to a minority preference, a female preference, and a, a military preference. And I dropped to 17th on the list, which was, you know, that's life. Yep. Um, that's why I hadn't gotten into teaching. I still hadn't finished my degree. So it gave me an opportunity to go back, get my degree. And then I signed my first teaching contract. I was coaching at Lynn Classical. Uh, it was 1980, 1981, 1980. Mm. Um, and um, I had, there was no jobs in Lynn. So I took a, t- a teaching job, teaching carpentry in, wow. at North Shore Tech. And um, I, my first co- teacher's contract was for twelve thousand five hundred dollars. That was my contract. <laughs> and um, so now I'm two years into coaching at Classical, and um, I'm two years into my contract at North Shore Tech, and I get a, a card from the police academy to show up to the police academy. Mm. And now I'm, I'm I'm looking at it, and I sit down with Carol, my wife, and we talk about it, and I say, "Well, what do you think?" So she doesn't say anything. She gets up. She walks upstairs, she comes back downstairs with my our yearbook. Mm. And she hands me the yearbook and she goes, you know, look, go look up your picture. Mm. So I flip it open, I look up my picture and underneath my picture where it says, you know, career, you know, career desire, it says teacher slash coach. Wow. So she says to me, she goes, it, it doesn't say police officer. Wow. So we're sitting there. And at that point in time, I said, you know what, Carol, you're right. And I tore the card up and I never went to the police academy. And um, because I, I, at that point, I had made a commitment to a contract, but I also I had made a commitment to a career. Yeah. I knew then that as a 17 year old kid in high school, I wanted to be a teacher and a coach. Mm-hmm. And that and the and, and so that was one of the things that I, I had set my mind early on. And she just gave me that, you know, that memory. It would have maybe would have been nice to be a police officer but it was a completely different world. And I, I really felt that as a coach and as an educator, I could have a bigger impact on kids mm-hmm. and bigger impact on people than, than a police officer at the time. And not, nothing against police, police officers, but you know, I could be in the inner, inner, you know, the inner sanction of, yeah. of where kids really are in education. Yeah. You know? um, so that was my choice. So that was you know, kind of identifying yeah early on who I was yeah. and Carol coming up and just giving me a, a, a refocusing me, yeah. you know, kind of putting me back on track of where yeah. I really needed to be, you know? Wow. And, you know, and, and the other thing is in my life, I also, I wanted to be a phys ed teacher. Mm. And so, uh, you know, I was working towards being a phys ed teacher. I got my degree and, you know, the prop two and a half had come around and they were laying people off. And the first people that were getting laid off was gym teachers. Wow. So I can remember in Lynn, the Lynn school system getting a pink slip twice at the end of the year. I got laid off. And mm-hmm. I can remember coming out of the administration building one day with my pink slip, going home, no job, no guarantee the next year. Meanwhile, I'm the head coach at classical, head football coach. Wow. And Claire Crane was um, special ed director in Lynn, came down and she had mentioned to me, she goes, there's a program over at uh, Mount Ida through the uh, mm-hmm. UMass Boston. You can get certified for a special ed teacher 
throughout six six courses in the summer. And uh, she said, you know, you should think about it. And I said, nah, 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 I'm not going special ed. Nah, I'm fine, I'm fine. Got in my car, thought about it. I walked back in, got the paperwork, filled out the paperwork, got my certification as a special educator. And I never turned, I never looked back. Because I, I was in a place there where there was a lot of kids who needed me. Mm. A lot of me, a lot of, you know, they needed a voice. Yep. Um, you know, when I started as a teacher's aide in a classroom uh, in the Lynn School Systems and worked my way up to be the director of special education in Georgetown, and I was, you know, a spe special administrator in Peabody. And so, you know, when I left Lynn and went to Peabody, um, I can remember, and you might recognize some of these names, sitting in a room with Joe Padalea, who was the principal at the time, mm. Peabody High School, used to be at Lynn English, mm. and uh, uh, Dr. Lou Perullo, who was the superintendent of Peabody Schools. Yep. They called me into their office, and the two of them were sitting there, along with you know Coach Nizmentowski, and they said, uh, we'd like you to come to Peabody. We want you to coach football, but more importantly, we want you to start an alternative school. Yep. I knew nothing about starting an alternative school, <laughs> but I knew that there was a bunch of kids at Peabody High School that needed some direction. Yeah. And uh, so I spent the next eight years building an alternative school. Yeah. And uh, you know I went and got my master's in school administration and secondary education, and um, that was my plan. My mm -hmm. plan was to build. We started with 15 students and seven staff. And when I left to uh, go to another administrator's position at Triton Regional High School, there was 75 students and 22 staff. Yes. And um, so, again, it gave me an opportunity mm -hmm. to look at the most needy, yep. the most difficult kids in, our, in, in the population of the PV school system yep. and say, how can I help them? And that's what I used to tell them. I used to have the toughest kids from, from Peabody that were either up for an expulsion or they were going to get kicked out of school yeah. or they were going to go to jail. Uh, the juvenile court over in Salem used to say to the kids, go to, you're going to Dave Dempsey's Peabody Alternative High School. And they'd send them to the, they'd, they'd send them to the high school. Wow. And so, but I knew that at that point, again, it was about filling the need of really, really needy kids and getting each one of them to graduate from high school and getting each one of them to move forward and better themselves and have an understanding. Um, and, you know, for, for a long time, those kids that were in this alternative school, they were always being judged, yep. you know. Mm -hmm. They were always, they always had a label. Yep. They always had, and I used to tell the kids every morning, we'd start our program out with a, with a group meeting, and I would say to them every morning, and I'd point out to every one of our staff members, and I said, every one of those people are here for you. Yeah. We're not here because we get kicked out of the high school. Yeah. We're not here because we're bad teachers and we yeah. get sent to the alternative school. Every one of the people that here that work here are here yeah. because they've chose to come here to help you yeah. improve your lives. And what it did was it gave those students a, a little bit different level of respect for yeah. all of us. You know, there was never any teacher abuse. Mm -hmm. It was always yeah. self-control. The kids controlled yeah. each other, and but they knew that we were the people that were there to help them. Yep. You know, we weren't there to argue with them or fight with them or get them expelled or get them in trouble or, you know, we were there to help yep. them. And, and it created an environment where, um, you know, we had our own little graduation yep. and everybody got their high school diplomas. Yep. And it, 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 so again, it was an opportunity for me to create something that was completely different, yep. and, but it was also, it met the needs of a lot of kids yep. who were in trouble. Yeah, there's two, there's two big takeaways. I mean, there's many takeaways, but two big takeaways. Um, the first one is, you know, your ability to stay focused on the mission. What is the mission? Mission critical for you was helping other people do better, get to the right place, or filling the gap so that they could grow. Awesome. The second part, though, is, you know, there's perseverance here. You were, here's this young man from the projects, growing up in a primarily single family home, with sisters who excels in high school, becomes a teacher coach, um, goes from one place who, where he develops some incredible young talent, takes many kids off the street, then starts an alternative school. That perseverance and then that trajectory, um, there's innovation there, there's perseverance lessons, there's leadership lessons. Coach, I wanna talk about leadership. A lot, it's a big term, Everyone talks about leadership. He, this guy's a leader. This woman's a leader. Da, da, da. What is leadership? I think, first of all, I think leadership is something that um, if you believe in something and you really, you, you put your mind to it um, and you're willing 
to to lead by example and where and don't you know I've never used the word leadership or I'm leader or a boss or I'm this yeah. because I, I don't think a, a good leader ever has to tell anybody yeah. he's a leader or she's a leader yeah. I think that it just it, it develops yeah. and so to me uh, leadership is is is, is Going out, setting a goal, or setting a setting a, a, a point of a, a point of accomplishment, and and working and putting all of your efforts towards that, and believing in it. Yeah. And when you believe in something strongly, and you really feel that this is necessary and this is you know good for society, then it's really about people will follow that, and that's what leadership is. I'll tell you a story about the alternative school. Um, we had. We had established the alternative schools. We were in our fourth year, and we were doing really well. There was a lot of kids who were saved from being expelled from school, and an expulsion means you were done. You don't. You got. You know, a kid brings a knife to school. He'd end up with me. You know, they get into a fight. They hit. They end up. With, they would end up with us. Mm -hmm. And I can remember there were there was a question. The school committee was questioning whether they wanted to bring the the students back to the high school mm -hmm. and kind of do away with the alternative setting because of the cost factor of having another building yeah. having a whole complete staff so i went to the school committee meeting that night and um dr perulo was there and dr perulo was a superintendent he was in favor of keeping the alternative school and he asked me if i would speak to the school committee and i said sure i'd be more than happy to speak to them so when it was the opportunity to speak to them, I stepped up before the school committee and I introduced myself as the, you know, the, the principal of the alternative high school in PVD. And, um, you know, I said to them, I said, I just want to, let me, let me just kind of help you to understand what this alternative school is all about. I said, let's step away for a minute and mm -hmm. let's imagine that you are the board of directors and the board of trustees in a, in a, in a major hospital. And you were at a budget meeting and you were looking at it from a, from a, from a budget financial standpoint. I said, when it came time to make decisions, I said, would you cut out your intensive care unit, mm -hmm. your ICU, mm -hmm. the people who need your best doctors, mm -hmm. the people who are the sickest, the people who need the hospital more than anybody else, would you eliminate that? Yeah. I said, because the alternative school is our intensive care unit. Mm -hmm. I said, and that's where we have the people who are most dedicated to these kids. And these kids need school and need us more than any other kid in the high school. And I said, so that's what this is. Yep. This alternative school is our intensive care unit. I said, and we, they belong here. And I said, and number two, I said, these kids aren't going away. I said, if we don't take care of them now and give them a better road to life and open doors of opportunity for them now, they're going to reappear. They're going to reappear in our courtrooms. They're going to reappear in our juvenile dis dis detention centers. Mm -hmm. They're going to re reappear in our hospitals. They're going to reappear in our in our public welfare lines. You know, when when they be when they become pregnant or when other things yeah. happen in their lives, yeah. they're never going to go away. Yeah. So the best this is our best opportunity right now yeah. to establish these kids and and give them a better life and give them a better opportunity. And when I got done, the whole place stood up and started clapping. Mm. But that's but that created leadership. Yep. And th and after that, there were people at the high school that actually wanted to come to work at the alternative school because mm -hmm. they knew that I had a high level of determination to make this successful. Yeah. And it wasn't about me. Yeah, it was about all those kids. Yep. You know, and so and I think that's where that's where leadership comes from. Yeah. It comes from cr creating an environment that you believe in so strongly that you're willing to 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 put all to put everything yeah. you know out there. And so um, what I love about the story that too though is you gave people vision. Right. You gave people a big picture view of what mattered most. Gave them something to believe in to inspire to right. and go for it. That's pretty cool. Yeah. And so that it it, it we of course we stayed the alternative school yeah. stayed and uh, <laughs> Um, it's uh, it's actually still in existence. It was moved mm. to the to the to the North Shore Mall in a nice. They have their own yep. s area there where they they have they still have their classes. Yep. So you know it was um, again, and I, and I think you know that's where leadership comes from. Yep. Leadership comes from inside a determination yep. to 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 create something that yep. that you truly believe in. Yeah. You know, Coach, I got two other topics that I want to cover. Um, one is uh, the role of faith in your life. And then we'll finish up with something else, another topic. But I want to talk about faith. What role has faith played in your life? Well, you know, I um, I, I have to say I'm not a church goer, but I, um, you know, I talk to God a lot. I believe in, in that there is, you know, there is some direction in it. Yeah. But you know, 
The greatest faith that I have, David, comes from other people. Mm. Uh, comes from people like you. Comes mm. from people that I see have 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 taken a role in their life and want to move forward. To me, um, that's where that's where where faith is. I I, I truly believe that you know um, we're all on this earth together, mm. and it. it um, and everybody, there's all the different religions and there's all the different ways of, of having faith in what, yep. what you believe in. Um, you know, I say, I say a prayer every night when I go to bed. Yep. Uh, there's things in my life that I would like to see better and change yep. and be different. Um, so I, 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 I go, to, go to faith in that area. Um, I, I also believe in that, um, you know, there comes a time in all of our, all of our lives, especially when you get to be my age and you start to look, because I truly believe that, you know, death is death is a part of life. Absolutely. And there comes a time when you have to start to think about, you know, what is what is death? What you know? Wh why are we here? What? How come we? You know, we've been put on this earth to to to, to do something. Yeah. And so, I, I strongly believe that there there that there there is a there is a, a higher being. Yeah. Um, and I think that a lot of times in our life we we miss we get away from that, we miss that. Um, you know, when I was a kid, you know, it, uh, all the kids wanted to be an altar boy. I wanted to be a linebacker. You know, it was, um, uh, you know, I can remember one time again, you know, my mother caught me. Um, I, my sister told on me that I wasn't going to church. I was going to Eddie's drugstore and buying, spending the 25 cents for the, for the basket <laughs> on a vanilla Coke. And, and uh, so, uh, you know, I got in trouble for that. My mother made sure I talked to Father Walsh and made sure I was yeah. in, in mass when it was supposed to be. So it's, you know, and again, that, you know, that's, that, that's, that's my life. You know, it's, it's, those are the challenges yeah, that I, I love had. it. Yeah. It's, I love it. I, you know, look, I, I, I like to ask the question because, um, you know, I really believe that faith was something very different years ago. And from my point of view, faith is very simple. It is having a source of truth, character, values, purpose. And for me, that's Christ, right. the story of Jesus Christ. Now, um, the last question I want to ask you, coach, is who is David Dempsey? And what is his purpose? Uh, yeah, I think you know. I think David Dempsey is a, is a is a uh, a person that came on this earth, and um, uh, a lot of people stepped into his life mm. and um, gave him some guidance and some direction and helped him. And I think um, through the grace of God and through my mother, um, I learned to become a giver, mm. and um, I learned it early in life. And uh, I think I've. Um, I think I've taken the opportunity in my lifetime um, to to help other yeah. people and to put other people before me. Yeah. Um, you know, I it, it's it's uh, to me the most gratifying thing that I can 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 happen to me in my life. It's you know, it's not going on a great vacation. It's not doing this. It's about you know, if I see somebody that's in need or something, um, trying to reach out. And uh, you know, I've always made that my mantra. And um, you know, it's. Uh, you know, for some reason, I, like I said, I came from being an IA in a classroom to being a director of special education. I came from being an assistant coach to being a head coach. I came from being somebody who didn't know anything about an alternative high school and built an alternative high school. Somewhere, somewhere along the line, people intervened in all of those areas to help me be better at what I, what I am. And I think that's where we can all give back. Yeah. Um, I truly believe that there's, there, there are two types of people in this world. There's givers and there's takers. Yeah. And, um, you know, the, it's the, the, the people who will help others and give uh, will be rewarded the most yeah. in the end. Yeah. And that's, you know, Dave Dempsey, I think, is a person that uh, believes in, in helping other people and believes in, you know, the, the, the being of high character. And um, so I think that's where, where, you know, I've established myself. Uh, I think that there's a lot of people in this world that I've helped, um, but I, I don't I don't measure myself like that. I yeah. just look at it as that again. I was just there to help, you know, fill in the dots, and yeah. that's what somebody did to me. They filled in my dots and got me to where I am. Yeah. You know, one of the famous quotes. Uh, I have so many. I call them Dempseyisms. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the one of the ones that I, another one that I talk about about in my book, Coach, is. Um, you said to me one time and, and the players, if you can't see it, you can't be it. I never forgot it. That's right. It started helping me to think about what can I, what's possible for me. Right. right. Not this. I can do better. Um, so I appreciate that. Coach, thank you for spending the morning with me talking uh, through uh, uh, Grip Machine DNA. 
look for the interview, look for follow interviews on our page, uh, www.davidamorales.com. Coach, thank you. You were incredible. Well, appreciate thank you. you very much. Thank you, and I, uh, I appreciate being here. And like I said, you know, maybe we have to start a movement. Maybe we have to start putting something together of, um, you know, of men and women to, um, to really start touching, reaching out to young kids and young people. 100% agree. Thanks, everybody. Talk to you soon. Si vives día a día en un abismo de dolor y buscas solución a tus problemas, busca del Señor y sigue su camino y pronto nacerá la paz. En tu corazón y con la paz del Señor, yo he vencido mi temor y yo vivo victorioso por su amor. Y con la paz del Señor, yo he vencido mi temor y yo vivo victorioso por su amor. Si vives de en un abismo de dolor y busca solución a tus problemas busca del Señor